So let me start by introducing Chris Sally to you. Chris is a lawyer in my office. As I said, he's a partner of mine. And he does handle many of the construction cases that we have in the office, whether it's 240 case or 241-6 case. Chris has also had a good deal of experience in handling a lot, handling a lot of products liability cases. And we uh, very often go to Chris when we have questions such as whether or not something is going to fall within 240 or 241-6 and what the appropriate section of the industrial code is. He seems to have all the answers for us, so we're very happy to have Chris here with us. So without further ado, let me bring Chris off, Sally out and start for the plaintiff. Chris, come on up. Thank you, Ben. Um, so you get a phone call. By the show of hand, before I get started, how many plaintiff attorneys who do primarily plaintiff's work here in the audience? And how many primary defense? Insurance adjusters? Okay. All right. Plaintiff, here's how the case generally goes as far as what you do and what you start thinking of at the inception of the case. You get a phone call. Nine times out of ten, it's from a referring attorney. Got a great label book case for you. Oh, yeah? Client fell off a ladder. Sounds good. What was he doing? Oh, he was hanging a light bulb at his brother-in-law's house. <laughs> Sorry to tell you, that's not a label book case. There's a lot more that goes into it than simply a lot of attorneys think. A label book case is simply, guy fell off a ladder, guy fell off a scaffold, I'm going to get a check. It's not that simple with a label book case. There's a lot of things that have to be done, and when Ben asked me to do this thing, I basically thought of that initial phone call I had with a referring attorney or a client or a relative of the client, whomever, what questions do I ask at the beginning and why I ask them? First question I always ask is, what was the guy doing at the time? Why was he on the ladder? Why was he on the scaffold? He better be doing some type of construction type activity. There's a statute, label of statute. Brian went shooting over in detail. I'm not going to go over the, all the nuances of the statute in the detail he did. But he better be doing something construction related. He better not be doing simply, you know, like I said, hanging a light bulb at his brother-in-law's house, okay? He's got to be doing something construction related, and he has to be employed at the construction site. He can't be just visiting. He can't be a volunteer, like Brian said. He's got to be doing something that he was there for. He was employed at the site. So that's a question I would ask. I said, well, why was he there? He was hanging sheetrock. All right. So I know he fell off a ladder. He was hanging sheetrock. Okay. Sheetrock is part of construction. What type of building was he working on? Was it a one or a two family house? Critically important question, because if I don't ask that question, I can't, you know, I have to know whether I can sue the owner of the house. If I do sue the owner of the house, and it's a one or two family house, the rules change. I have to show specific direction and control by the owner in order to hold the owner liable under the labor law, under labor law 240. If it's a 10 story building, I don't have to show that level of control like I do with a one or two family house. So I want to know, why was he there? What type of work was he doing? Is it a building or a structure? I get calls. My uh, guy fell off a ladder. What was he doing? He was cutting the limbs off of a tree. Why was he doing that? Well, they were clearing the area of the vacant lot to put up a high rise. All right, that might be incidentally related enough to a construction project that I can bring a label of 240 claim. If he was cutting the tree down because his neighbor decided the tree was overhanging his yard and it was a nuisance and the leaves were getting in his pool, well, that's not, and he fell off the ladder, that's not a label of 240 activity. That's not covered. I find that out in the initial phone call. The last thing I find out in the initial phone call, I have four things that I find out in that initial phone call. Um, what was wrong with the safety device? Simple question. If the guy fell off the ladder because he had stepped in oil and trapped it up the ladder that he set up himself, there was nothing at all wrong with the ladder, well, I may have a problem in that case. I still may be able to win for other reasons, but I have, an, I have to know at the very beginning, I may have a problem in that case. And I have to know about it. I like to use an expression, and I always say, and you'll hear me repeat it throughout this entire time, does the client tell a labor law story? The courts want to hear a labor law story. Most of the appellate cases you'll see, and Brian talked about it, and we all get chuckles out of them, involve the most ridiculous fact patterns you've ever seen of guys doing things at a construction site. Some of the things that you can't even imagine, why on earth anyone in their right mind would do this at a construction site and that often, it makes the law on a labor law case. 
the law goes back and forth. You know, saying that you understand what this law is evolving into. I think the court used the television. Used, I'm sorry, the court of appeals used the expression. This is constantly evolving. Charles Darwin could not figure out the evolution of the labor law. It goes back and forth every five years, depending on who's sitting on what court and at what time and what weird fact pattern they get. So you really, I always try to prep it is when I get that initial phone call, that initial investigation I want to conduct, is the client telling a labor law story? Once I have that in my mind, all right, here's what happened. He fell off the ladder. Why did he fall off the ladder? The ladder was placed on uneven ground. Why was it placed on uneven ground? That's the only place he could have put the ladder to do the sheetrock work he was doing. All right, now I have a labor law case possibly. I have a ladder that's unsteady or unfit for the purposes and according to the statute, in my view, did not provide adequate protection for the worker. And that's the language. One thing I do almost every time I get a labor law case, I pull a copy of Labor Law 240, and I, I read it over, I make sure I, yeah, I'm, right, I'm pretty safe on this, and I throw it in the file, and I make sure I have it, so that I can always refer to it, so I know I can meet those parameters. Because it's not a common law claim, it's not negligence, it's specific claims against an owner and a GC or an agent of the owner, who oftentimes had nothing to do whatsoever with the happening of the accident. Half the time they weren't even there, especially the owner. The owner of a construction project, I mean, I have, I have very rarely ever seen an owner of a construction project who I've taken the deposition of, say, when were you there at the site? I visited it once a month. I had somebody, you know, walk me through it, and that paint looked great, the, you know, the walls looked good, I didn't like where that toilet was, so I told him. But otherwise, I'm not there. They usually have a construction manager or a general contractor or some other agent who's responsible for being their eyes and their ears. Okay, so at the inception, I have to know that going in. What do I do after I get that phone call and I decide, all right, the guy's got a bad enough injury, it sounds like a good labor law case, I want to do my investigation. People make mistakes with the investigation. The most important thing to do with the investigation is witness statements. Find out if there are any and get them, but don't just get witness statements, get them in affidavit form. Why? I'm thinking for my summary judgment motion, either that I'm going to have to make to try to win liability as a plaintiff, or that I'm going to have to oppose from the defendant who's going to say this was not a covered activity, you know, proximate, sole proximate cause defense, recalcitrant worker, whatever the defense is, I want to have affidavits. Now, I have, and I mean, and people here who know me will witness this, I have had people in my office at 9, 10 o'clock at night with a Spanish translator translating the affidavits is so that the guys understand what they're signing and what they're saying so that I know three years from now I can defeat a summary judgment motion for a defendant or I can win one outright. And that's very important to do at the beginning. Now, a lot of times, let's be honest, the witnesses to the accidents, if there are witnesses, you know, a guy's brother-in-law got him a job with the union or at the job site, and his, his other friend, they all, they all came to work together that day, three of them. None of them speak a word of English. None, all of them are afraid of losing their jobs. They don't want to say anything that would put their jobs in jeopardy. I don't want to go against my the contractor, the boss, the foreman. I can get, but if I get a witness statement saying, this was the only place he could have put that ladder. They think that's kind of innocuous in their mind. You know, well, what's wrong with that? Who's going to fire me? How am I going to get in trouble if I sign a witness statement saying that my brother-in-law put the ladder there to do the sheetrock and it was unsteady ground, but that was the only place I could put the ladder. You know, they won't sign the statement oftentimes that says, the foreman told me, uh, never told me to use a harness. They don't want to do anything where it says, oh, the foreman or someone told him to do something. They don't usually like those statements, but it's often good enough to get him to say something that we know as attorneys, as a plaintiff attorney, is good enough for a labor law claim. It's good enough. You can get, you know, listen, you know this case and say, hey, you know, an un unsteady ladder on uneven footing, guy falls hanging sheetrock, that's a labor law case. And you can win summary judgment as a plaintiff in that regard. That might be good enough for an affidavit. And those are the kind of things you have to think of about this case. What would be good enough if the guy, hey, if the guys are willing to go ahead with the uh, witness statements and give you everything, God bless you. That's usually not the case. They're usually afraid of something. There's usually something going on in their minds. They don't want to commit too much, but you know what's enough. And that's something very important to take advantage of at the early stage before they, you know, have had other chances to talk to people. A lot of times we have an advantage over the defendants in that regard. They may not know completely about the accident, or they may not have had a chance to talk to the witnesses. Or if they got their own witness statements, or maybe the witnesses are willing to give you a statement as well. That's not quite the same as the defendant's statement they got, they had already given, but it's good enough. Very important to do at the beginning. 
Other thing important to do at the beginning is go take photos. Get your investigator to go take photos of the accident site. In particular, if he can take a picture or she can take a picture of the equipment that the guy was using at the time. If you can get a picture of a Baker scaffold, how many of you know what a Baker scaffold is? Okay, a Baker scaffold is a rolling scaffold with wheels on it. It locks, it's got different heights, it's got, sometimes it has rails around it, sometimes it doesn't. But it's used a lot by painters and, and um, sheet rockers, sanders, things of that nature. <coughs> Oftentimes, the Baker scaffold, it moves, it rolls, because the wheels weren't locked, or they weren't locked properly, or the thing was 20 years old and the darn locking had, thing hasn't worked, mechanism hasn't worked in 10 years, because it's all worn and no one ever bothered to replace it. So the guy's up there standing, puts a little pressure on the platform, the thing rolls back, he goes face forward. Right to the floor. All right, get a picture of that scaffold. Why? Because at depositions, you're going to say, Is this the scaffold? And you know, you'll serve it on the defendant. The defendant will ask question, play, Is this the scaffold you were using? Yes. Could you show me the wheels weren't locked? The right wheel over here wasn't locked. And the defense will ask the question, Well, did you check that wheel? No, that wasn't my job. Or maybe it was his job, depending on the circumstances. But maybe it was oftentimes the foreman who was supposed to set up that scaffold for the laborer to do the work on. The foreman's one say, Okay, guys. You're going to be sanding this wall today because we're going to put the, put the um, prime coat on today, and then tomorrow we're going to, skip, we're going to put the regular finish coat on, on the paint. Foreman's going to set up the scaffold. Workers half the time never would check the wheels. They get up on the scaffold. They're doing the thing. They're doing their job. The wheels move. The thing rolls. They fall, and they get injured. Get a picture of that scaffold if you can. Now, often, oftentimes, obviously, you're not going to have access to a construction site unless you have a very creative investigator. Um, you know, sometimes you can. Okay? That's very important to do at the beginning. Um, OSHA reports at the beginning of the case. If it's a very bad injury, fatal injury, get the OSHA. In your, in your materials, pages 101 and 103, are letters to OSHA that our, office, that our office uses to get the OSHA reports. Now, OSHA violations are not going to be admissible um, as evidence of, you know, as, as proof of the accident. But the facts in there are critical. They give you a roadmap for the entire case. If you have an OSHA report which says <coughs> that the, um, the, the plaintiff um, was given a harness, but there was nothing to tie it off to, well, now you know. Now you have your basis for your label or motion, and you, just, you uh, build your discovery around that fact. It was nowhere for him to tie it off to. So the defense attorney, you know, you're prepping your client for the deposition. The defense attorney asks, were well, you given a harness? Yes. Why didn't you tie it off? There was nowhere to tie it off to. Well, that's a labor law 240 violation. If the guy falls and is injured um, as a result of that, you have a summary judgment motion for the plaintiff on that case, and you can win that one very easily. Um, other things to get at the beginning of the case, surveillance tapes. A lot of job sites nowadays, and again, this might be something you have to do during discovery, but if you can get it prior to discovery, uh, maybe the plaintiff has a friend at the job site who can get a hold of the videotape, you, know, you at the very least should serve a letter demanding that it be preserved. Um, these things are often erased after a week or 30 days, depending on the situation. You have to send that out right away. But if you can get a hold of the surveillance tape, I have a case right now where a header on a window, which is a metal beam on the top of the window for framing, the guy was installing it, he bent down to pick up a tool, the thing went out the window and landed on somebody. All right, there's a videotape of it, of the thing falling out the window and hitting the guy in the arm. All right, now, I wasn't gonna probably, I'm not going to probably lose that case anyway, but by the same token, that videotape is very powerful. And I got that by the client who had a friend who, was, who worked as a foreman at the building who got him a copy of that tape before the lawsuit even started. Okay? Um, now, let's just talk a little bit about you know, police reports, department of buildings, the stuff you would normally get. You obviously get. Okay? But I want to talk a little bit about um, other things. Plaintiff's workers' compensation report. Uh, oftentimes, you'll get this phone call, if, and a plaintiff, his union, or someone has already filled out a workers' comp report by the plaintiff. He signed it before you ever even got in the case. Okay? How many defense attorneys love to get that report and show it to the plaintiff at the deposition? And when the plaintiff says, I jumped off the scaffold, I jumped <laughs> off the ladder, you know, a spider, you know, swung past my face and I fell off. All right, something ridiculous, okay? Um, you, play it, you have to get that, and you have to be ready for that prior to the plaintiff's deposition. If you don't have your client knowing what is said in that report, 
you know, you're in big trouble because I, I don't, if I were a defense attorney, that's one of the, I mean, later on in the deposition, after I've got everything all established, I whip out that report and I say, did you ever write, write the workers' comp and tell them that this accident happened because you fell off, because you jumped off the scaffold? Oh, it's dead. Uh, I, 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 if I were a defense attorney, I'd love that. I always had the client prepare for that. They say, yeah, I jumped off the scaffold because it shifted. Okay? There's a way around it where you have to know what's coming before you get to that point. Um, hospital records, ambulance call report, F, you know, 9 11 report, FDNY reports. Whatever the client says as far as how the accident happened, you better know about it before you even get to the plaintiff's deposition. You better know what your client says. If you have something, you hate being surprised at the deposition where all of a sudden, you know, a good defense attorney brings out the, uh, the EMS report where it says the client, you know, says that he was drinking or something, there's something ridiculous in there. Now, all right, you know, now I'm in trouble. You don't want to have to face that situation. Um, now, when you start the lawsuit, when you start the lawsuit, but before I get into the 240, um, Lawsuit. It, it applies to all of them. You know, the 2416, Brian Shu talked about a labor law 2416 claim. You're not really going to be making a summary judgment motion in that type of case. More often, as a plaintiff, you're defending those motions. Uh, in order to really um, to understand the law in that area, you just really need to look at the uh, PJI, the pattern jury instructions. Every single industrial code statute that is good enough is listed in there. And the ones that aren't good enough are also listed in there. So if you're a plaintiff and you have a Suspect a 241.6 case involving maybe some guy left tools, scattered tools on a walkway. That's always a common one. Look in the, look in the PJI, make sure that, that is something that you have and you can plead that properly at the very beginning of the case. Don't wait until after the defendant moves to dismiss saying you didn't give me an industrial code violation. Then you say, oh yeah, it's, it's you know, 1 day 787. You know, well, well it's might be too late. Okay? Make sure you have that at the very beginning of the case. And as far as a labor law 200 case is concerned, when you're thinking about it at the beginning of the case, if it's a labor law 200 case, there's two types of labor law 200 cases. Okay? One is a um, means and methods thing. In other words, in order to hold the owner or GC liable, the worker had to be injured doing something which, <coughs> excuse me, due to the manner in which the work was being performed. It was done in a dangerous or negligent type of manner. And the owner of GC had the authority, the actual authority, to supervise and direct and control that work. It's not enough that they just knew about it. They had to have the authority to say, hey, you're doing it the wrong way, do it this way, and they were directing it from the beginning. Okay, it's a big showing. That's one 200 case. The other 200 case is the dangerous condition case. If there's a dangerous condition at the premises which causes an injury to uh, the plaintiff, for example, a, a broken pipe sticking up out of the ground in an area where the workers have to walk past every single day to get to the work area, you have to show actual or constructive notice, okay, Simple, similar to a trip and fall type case, and you have to show a sufficient authority to ensure that the hazard was corrected. It's not enough that you know, he had knowledge of it. He had to have the ability to do something about it. Critically important in a 200 case. Okay? Um, now, you start the lawsuit. What are you going to demand? Applies to any kind of construction accident case. Well, there's a number of things you're going to demand. They always demand work permits. You know, there's, there's all the sim discovery demands in the, in the materials. There's other things, though, that have kind of evolved over the years. All right? Uh, progress photos, okay? Progress photos. At big construction sites, oftentimes the owner of the GC has a company or a person who's employed directly by them. Oftentimes I find they have a third party company whose job it is to walk around the job site every week and take photos. It's all digitized. They can take a thousand photos. It doesn't, you know, they don't care. It's not wasting film. They're just, they're just basically taking photos that are stored somewhere. Demand those. Oftentimes you will see photos from the day of the accident, the day before the accident, the day after the accident, but there'll be photos of the exact location where the accident happened. Maybe they'll show the uneven ground. Maybe they'll show the baker scaffold that was involved in the accident. Maybe they'll show the planks sitting on top of the doors that fell on our client because they weren't properly secured. That's the fact pattern that's going to be um, a, a trial coming up. Maybe they'll show those things, but in most big construction sites nowadays, there'll be progress photos. Demand them. In addition, 
Um, they have these meetings. You, people know, you know, they call them safety meetings, they call them toolbox meetings, site safety meetings. However they're couched, use as many different combinations of those phrases as you can, there'll be minutes kept. What will be discussed at those, minutes, at those meetings is important. What's also important is what's not discussed. If there was no discussion as to, in any of the minutes prior to the time of the accident, the proper means of setting up a Baker scaffold, that is something you can ask when you get the witness for the defendant on, 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 at the deposition, ask him, could you tell me one of these site safety meetings where the proper method of setting up a Baker scaffold was discussed? And then yeah, spend 20 minutes looking through the minutes, I don't see any. Would it be fair to say if it was discussed, it would be in these minutes? Maybe, maybe not. All right, but at the very least, it's not, we know it's not recorded anywhere in the minutes. So basically, you're saying, you know, you discussed the proper means of holding a screwdriver on March 2nd, 2011, but you never discussed the proper means of setting up a Baker scaffold? Yes, that sure looks ridiculous, okay? So, toolbox minutes, it's very important. Um, a site safety Often at the big job sites, the big construction sites, there's a site safety plan that's either performed, uh, either produced by the GC himself, herself, or a construction manager, or they hire a company, a safety company, whose job it is to prepare a site safety plan. That site safety plan is discoverable and should be gotten to get ready for the deposition. In addition to the contracts, which is going to spell out the duties between the owner, the construction manager, and the GC, or whomever, the subcontractors, the site safety plan will oftentimes say how things are supposed to be set up, how they're supposed to be monitored, who's supposed to be checking these things on a regular basis, at what intervals, to determine if they've been done and utilized in a safe manner. Very important. Now, when you are preparing your plaintiff for the deposition, anticipate the defenses. It's, it's a simple kind of concept, but it's, it's, it's important. The recalcitrant worker and the sole proximate cause, really the sole proximate cause defense is kind of subsumed the recalcitrant worker defense. They're kind of all kind of jumbled together at this point. But the sole proximate cause defense, what does that mean? The plaintiff is responsible 100% for this accident. We had nothing to do with it. Okay? Anticipate that defense as when you're, when you're talking to your plaintiff, saying, listen, the Baker scaffolding, who set it up? I did. You set it up yourself? Yes. Did you lock the wheels? I don't think so. All right, well, you've got a problem there. If you're a Mr. Blanket attorney, you've got a real problem there. You know, so you have to find that out. Which hopefully you know that before the hand, beforehand. But you know the defense attorney is going to be asking that. Who set it up? Who checked the wheels? Whose job was it to check the wheels to make sure they were locked? You were the one who was going to be utilizing it. Wouldn't you agree that you should have checked the wheels before you got on that scaffold? Okay? That is something that's very important. Anticipate those defenses. Were you given specific instructions as far as a safety harness is concerned? Yes. Did you understand those instructions? Yes. No. And this is a converse. It's something I'm talking about with the defendant depositions. If you have the person who allegedly gave the instructions to the plaintiff to use something, you have to ask them as a plaintiff. Did the person understand the instructions? Well, how do I know that? Well, did they speak English? Did they give you any type of indication or communication that they understood your instructions to use the safety harness immediately prior to the accident. What did they tell you? What, what words did they use? Did, do you know if they spoke English? Did they speak, you know, a lot of times you have a bridge painting case, a lot of the workers in the bridge painting cases don't speak Spanish, they speak Portuguese. Now, it's kind of a similar language, but there's a lot of times there's nuances and there's misunderstandings. You have to find out what was those instructions, what language was given it? Was the worker Polish? Did he understand those, that language that you used as far as those instructions are concerned, and how did he indicate that he understood that language? Um, now, again, when you do the plaintiff's deposition, you now uh, the plaintiff must tell a labor law story. Okay, if it doesn't tell a labor law story, you're going to have a problem because you're going to have issues, and you're going to have all these the case that becomes this bizarre fact pattern that we uh, end up having, you know, labor law <coughs> seminars and construction uh, seminars discussing. That's what ends up happening. All right, if the, the guy tells a good labor law story at his deposition, you're going to be okay for moving for summary judgment. Now, when you take the defendant's deposition, same thing. You have to anticipate as a plaintiff the sole proximate clause of calcitrant worker defense, and you ask those questions I talked about. Did the guy understood? Did the guy acknowledge that he understood? Did he come late? How do you know he was there? I've had cases where the worker shows up a half an hour late from the union hall. They already had given the safety talk. He never got the safety talk. But the defense, the defense in the case is, 
I told all the workers to um, use a harness right before this accident. Well, do you know if my guy was there? Was he at the meeting? Did you take attendance? He testified he wasn't there. He got there late from the union hall because they called over at the union hall at 8.30 in the morning and said they needed five extra guys. He wasn't at that meeting. So he, you never gave him a specific instruction if he wasn't at the meeting. Can we, is that fair to say? Or did you walk around to every single individual worker and tell him, hey, Joe, put on your harness? No, I didn't do that. Well, then how do you know he got it? Well, I really don't. All right, now you just basically torpedoed the recalcitrant worker defense in that type of case. Now, when you're doing the other thing at the deposition that's always an issue as far as Labor Law 240 is concerned, and, and 241 and, and 200, the construction manager. Construction manager is not an, a uh, person listed under the statute. They're not. It's the owner, the GC, and agents of the owner. Okay? Construction managers oftentimes <coughs> will do anything in their power to divest themselves of all authority of supervision and control. So they, they had nothing to do with this at the site. They just were there, name only, they hired the subs, they did the schedule. Look at the contract. Look at the contract. There's certain contracts, um, you may have seen them, AIA contracts, um, where the construction manager at the beginning of the contract, and it's a funny kind of thing, you have to, if you go through it, you'll see what I mean. The owner, this agreement is between the owner and the construction manager, you know, John Smith Construction. And as the contract moves on, the term construction manager miraculously turns into contract. In the middle of the contract, it turns into contractor. Then you go back and you flip through the definitions. As the term is used here in, construction manager shall also mean contractor, or I may have it backwards, contractor shall also mean construction manager as is necessary to apply the terms here. Well, all right, now you have a contract calling them contractor. You go further in the contract, like Ryan Shute said, it's about what they did, not what they're called. Did you have the authority to supervise and control the job site? Well, of course I did. Did you have the authority to impose safety standards? I don't know what you mean by that. The foreman is responsible for the safety of his individual trades. Let me ask you this, sir. If you walked around the job site and you saw my client using a baker scaffold without the wheels locked, would you consider that a dangerous condition? Well, yes, I would. Okay. What would you do about it? I would tell the foreman. Did you ever have an occasion where the foreman didn't listen to you or didn't correct you? No, of course not. They know, they know, they know who's in charge. All right, so you had the authority to stop a dangerous condition if you saw it, correct? Yes. That's a lot like a general contractor now, isn't it? Now you're starting to build the pieces to defeat the construction manager defense and then get them into the general contractor defense. Now, the, a the agent of the owner doesn't always mean um, the general contractor. There could be a specific subcontractor whose job it was to enforce the safety rules on behalf of the owner. You have to find that out. Part of the discovery process, demand more contracts, all subcontractors, finding out who is there and what, and oftentimes you'll have this whole like, you know, bar chart or I don't know what you call it, hierarchy of the contractors at the job site and the owners with their individual responsibilities, oftentimes they're muddled, but you have to find that out. I'd much rather be the one saying that these two entities were acting as de facto GCs than rather than saying no one was acting as a de facto GC. It was every man for himself. I really would rather have that at the beginning. How much time Now, another part of the, um, from the plaintiff's perspective, of the sole proximate cause defense is the equipment. A big defense to these cases is he wasn't using an available scaffold um, that he could have used to prevent this accident. Instead, he used that cheap old ladder that, that had broken rungs and everything when he could have used the scaffold if he only had asked. Find out from the defendant's representative, whomever it is, a GC, the owner, usually it's a construction manager type person, where was that scaffold? Where was it? This is a 20-floor construction project. Was there one scaffold? Was there more than one scaffold? Was it in use that day? Who was using it? How readily available was it? How much time would it have taken for my guy to ask the foreman to get that scaffold moved from the 15th floor to the third floor so that he could do his sanding work in order to, to uh, prepare the uh, sheetrock for painting? There's, you know, the courts say readily available. Well, what's readily available? I want to get that thing as far away as possible, as hard to get as possible, so that my guy basically had no choice. He could either not work for three hours, in which case he's probably either going to get let go or sent home for the day and not get paid, 
Or he can make them make go up all these steps and all these <coughs> elevators and get to go through this whole big process to get that scaffold down to, to where he can use it. And then that really, really strains the definition of what is readily available. Very important to find out what equipment was available, where was it, what was the, what was the procedure to get it. Very important. Um, doing, and this is really maybe from the defense perspective or from the plaintiff's perspective, I think maybe from the defendant's perspective, is if you have witnesses, non-party witnesses, who you know are going to be coming in against you, and this really goes to either side, but I think it applies a lot often to the defendants because the plaintiffs all the time will have the affidavits or will have the witnesses more under their control, especially since a lot of times in these construction site settings, the witnesses are often friends and co-workers, they know each other, and they kind of want to help each other out to a degree as long as it doesn't jeopardize their jobs. You may want to consider taking the depositions of the non-parties. Um, you may want to find out what you're up against. You know, if you're going to have a deposition of a non-party, if you're going to have an affidavit of a non-party <laughs> that you have a reasonable um, expectation is going to be coming in against you on a summary judgment motion, find out ahead of time. Find out the deposition. Spend the money, do the deposition. Find out what that guy is going to say, um, rather than being surprised when you know, you get the motion or you make the motion and all of a sudden you get an affidavit in response that says the supervisor never instructed the plaintiff um, to use that safety device. That's complete baloney. This was the only ladder that was available. It was the only place to put it. It was on this broken concrete. It's uneven ground. Um, find that out. You have to take the deposition of the non-party. Um, you know, I, mean, I know most, most attorneys hate surprises. I know I do. Um, if I have an inkling that the defendant has a witness you know, that they've exchanged who is not being cooperative with my investigator, I may want to take that witness's deposition to find out exactly what he or she is going to say and what's going to hurt me. Um, I think that's all I have to end if anybody wants to go forward now.